learn about how to use the interactive Paycheck to Paycheck database and the, how the tool can inform advocacy efforts. My name is Maya Brennan, and I am a Senior Research Associate at the Center for Housing Policy. Joining me on this webinar is Janet Vivera, a, a Research Associate at the Center for Housing Policy as well. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Capital. Uh, I'd like to thank Capital One for sponsoring NHC's webinar series. Any opinions or errors, however, are ours alone. The Paycheck to Paycheck tool that we'll be exploring with you today is a longstanding product of NHC and its Center for Housing Policy. NHC and the Center work in concert with NHC's members to help ensure safe, decent, and affordable housing for all Americans. NHC engages in evidence-based advocacy, provides tools for effective communication, and deepens our understanding of housing issues through the research of the Center for Housing Policy. As I mentioned at the start, Janet Viveros and I will be your hosts and presenters on this webinar. Janet is a research associate at the Center with an interest in housing affordability data, disaster-resistant housing, and other ways in which research, policy, and practice come together to improve housing outcomes. I am a senior research associate here um, with coverage of a variety of topics, always with an interest in making research relevant and accessible for policy and practice. Before we begin with the heart of the webinar, I have a few more introductory notes. Uh, first, let's address technical difficulties. While we hope the webinar runs smoothly for everyone, we all know that doesn't always happen. If you run into any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box the GoToWebinar control panel to send a message to the staff so that we can help resolve the issue. If that does not work, please email us at chp-feedback at nhc.org. Next, let's cover another frequent question. Is this being recorded? Yes, an archived copy of this webinar will be available afterwards. Uh, we will send a link out to everyone who registered once the recording is online. So now that we have a little bit of the background out of the way, um, I want to find out a little bit more about you and who we have on the call. So you should start to see a poll. Um, we want to find out a little bit more about the occupations of the folks on here. So go ahead and take a minute to do that. Looks like we've got a pretty decent um, amount of responses at this point. We um, I'm going to share the results with you. Not surprisingly, we have a, a pretty large government and policy area. A fair amount also in advocacy and communications. This is a tremendous tool uh, in both of those areas, as well as folks on the practice and research sides and um, in the wide variety of, of the world known as known as other. Um, so this, this is great. It gives us a great sense of the fact that we're, we are reaching exactly the sorts of people that NHC and the center uh, typically do try to, try to reach. I have one more poll for you. We, um, paycheck, because Paycheck to Paycheck covers both home ownership and rental housing, we want to get a sense of what, um, what areas you're, you focus on. So please go ahead and take a moment to vote in there as well. Right, and I think I'll go ahead and close that. It looks like we've got a lot of good uh, votes on there. And just like paycheck to paycheck, uh, it looks like most of you are also focused on both um, home ownership and rental um, with a, a small number who are doing just one or the other. Uh, so thanks a lot for, for your responses. Now we're going to move on to um, we're going to move on to Janet describing a little bit more about Paycheck to Paycheck. Thank you, Maya. Ultimately, 
Paycheck to Paycheck is a housing affordability tool, uh, a way to look at what housing affordability challenges workers are facing. There's different ways that you can look at the housing affordability situation, um, but each different way gives you a different answer. Uh, so, for example, if you look at rental affordability just for minimum wage workers, you see a very dire picture. It's not surprising that very low-income workers have major affordability challenges, um, but it overlooks what the situation is for more moderate income workers in places that might be relatively affordable to workers at a variety of different incomes. If you look at housing affordability just based on home purchase prices and affordability at area median income, you get oftentimes too rosy of a picture because you don't see the gap of affordability and income for low and moderate income workers. Paycheck to Paycheck is a flexible approach to looking at housing affordability and offers a, a balanced picture of affordability. We look at wages of real workers in a variety of different industries at a variety of different income levels, low, moderate, and some higher income workers. And it also looks at both affordability for renting and for home buying and compares this affordability across various different metro areas that have very different housing markets. Now, what is Paycheck to Paycheck? It is an interactive online database that compares wages and housing costs, and it provides graphs that give an idea of the affordability of home buying or renting for workers in different occupations in different metro areas. What we have up right now is a graph that shows home buying affordability nationwide. You can see that in the first quarter of 2013, median home price nationwide was $184,000. The graph also gives you an idea of the income that a worker would need in order to affordably buy that home. And then it shows you median salary data for, in this particular graph, essential community workers at both moderate and lower income levels. And these graphs show not only the home ownership market, but also the rental market, which we'll get into a little bit later. And looking at this graph here, you can see that there are some real differences in the affordability challenges for moderate and lower income workers across the nation. However, this picture looks different in different places. So in terms of the data that actually goes into Paycheck to Paycheck, we have housing cost data that comes in the form of median home prices, as well as fair market rents issued by HUD for one and two bedroom units in over 200 different metro areas and across the nation as a whole. In the database, metro areas refer to core-based statistical areas, uh, which can contain the core city and their surrounding counties. So in some cases, these core-based statistical areas are smaller than the very, very broad metro areas like New York City. As you can see from the stats we have up here, there's pretty good coverage across the country and paycheck to paycheck. So some metro areas are missing because there wasn't home price data available in the national databases that we use. Uh, for example, we don't have data in Paycheck to Paycheck on Montana or Wyoming, but we would love to add them as soon as we do have the data that we need. One thing to keep in mind as we go forward is if your area or region isn't covered in Paycheck to Paycheck, there are ways that you can actually complete your own custom analysis uh, using the same methodology that we use in Paycheck to Paycheck. Now I want to open it up to you all um, and ask whether there are any metro areas that you would like us to take a look at later in the webinar. If you have some ideas, please submit them via the question tool. Another key part of the database is data on wages for workers in over 70 different occupations. You can see a listing here on the slide. The wage data comes from salary.com and it's for workers that have several years of experience, so typically one step up from entry level in their role. 
So it's not just wages for workers just starting out. Um, I'd also like to ask you, in addition to whether there are metro areas that you want us to look at later in the webcast, is also, are there specific occupations that you want to take a look at later? Um, you can submit your ideas via the question tool again. So when we talk about affordably buying a home, we make several assumptions and use several estimates to determine what would be affordable at various different income levels. So first off, we assume that a home would be affordable if the monthly costs constitute 28% or less of a worker's income. So this is a little bit different than the standard of 30% of income or less, less, but it is in accordance with conventional mortgage underwriting. We also assume that when we calculate these monthly costs, that the worker has a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, that they made a 10% down payment, we also use an average effective interest rate from FHFA, and we use a nationally blended estimate for private mortgage insurance and property taxes and insurance to give a, a somewhat full picture of home buying prices, excuse me, home buying costs. One thing to keep in mind, though, is because the last two numbers are blended, some metro areas do have higher private mortgage insurance and property tax and insurance costs, and some metro areas have lower costs. And these differences aren't truly reflected in paycheck to paycheck. And this is another area where you might want to consider doing your own custom analysis using the paycheck to paycheck methodology to adjust for local prices and conditions in some of these assumptions. Also, good to keep in mind that with a lot of the discussion right now centered on the anniversary of Hurricane Sandy, that there are some other home ownership costs that aren't reflected in paycheck to paycheck but are a reality for many homeowners, for example, like flood insurance. So there are a few things that don't make it into our estimate. Now, in terms of how affordability is calculated for renters, we do use the standard assumption of affordability if housing costs comprise 30% or less of income. And we use HUD's fair market rents to get an idea of typical rents for one bedroom and two bedroom units. Also, for both home buying and renting, we assume that there's one worker per household. In about 40% of households across America, uh, the household is headed by one worker for both home buying and renting. Now I'm going to pass it back over to Maya, who's going to talk a little bit about our most recent report from Patient. Janet, thanks for the great overview of Paycheck to Paycheck. So um, every year, in addition to updating the online database, we produce a report looking at housing affordability for a smaller slice of the workforce. Our most recent analysis focused on travel-related jobs. And during the height of travel season, these workers are busy making sure others can get to and enjoy their destinations, but can they afford a safe, decent place to call home? The graph that you should see here uh, shows rental affordability for five travel-related workers, housekeepers, wait staff, auto mechanics, hotel front desk managers, and flight attendants. And the dark green indicates that the two-bedroom fair market rent is unaffordable at median wages for these workers. Um, as you can see, in every single one of the 207 metro areas that we studied, a housekeeper or wait staff earned too little to afford typical two-bedroom rents on his or her own. Um, and I think that, that's, that's worth repeating and, and hammering home a little bit more. Out of 207 metro areas located in 48 states, there are none, that's none, in which the median income for housekeepers and wait staff working full-time with no days off are enough to pay typical two-bedroom rents on their own. Now, some of these workers may not need a two-bedroom apartment. Uh, they may have no dependents to house and support. Um, so we decided to look also uh, for those cases at fair market rents for a one-bedroom apartment. And what we found is that housekeepers could afford a typical one-bedroom apartment in only 17 out of the 207 metro areas. And wait staff could afford a typical one-bedroom in just 27 metros. This may not be surprising, considering the low wages of these two occupations. Um, the median incomes range from less than $20,000 a year to the mid-high $20,000 mark. 
um, and though we aren't surprised and a few people um, probably would be, it does clearly show that having a full-time job is no guarantee of making the rent. Uh, so that argument uh, should be out the door. And now let's look into the more moderate income workers on the graph. So you see the light green, uh, there's a fair amount of light green for auto mechanics and front desk managers. And for uh, flight attendants, all 207 metro areas have that light green indicating that they are affordable. Uh, but even so, um, there's mechanics and front desk managers with median incomes ranging from around $35,000 a year to the mid-50,000 area. Um, their wages were not enough to affordably rent a typical two-bedroom apartment in more than 30 of the higher cost metros studied. So now let's move on to the home ownership side. Um, you should see a, a fairly similar graph with a little bit of a more positive picture maybe for the housekeepers and wait staff, but a bleaker picture for, uh, for many of the other workers there. Um, how many metro areas have median home prices that are affordable for travel workers? So interestingly, those lower wage workers, as I pointed out, can affordably buy a median priced home in a few of the lowest cost metro areas. Um, these are largely places in Michigan or Ohio where the housing market was particularly hard hit um, by foreclosures. Um, um, all of our home ownership assumptions, however, are based on having good credit and a 10% down payment. These may not be reasonable assumptions for lower income workers, however. Um, getting some word that the phone that I'm on has more feedback than the phone that Janet is on. So I'm going to see if I can actually get her phone instead. Okay, so I hope this maybe works a touch better about feedback. Um, so the auto mechanics and front desk managers can afford the um, mortgage for median priced home in more than half of the metro areas studied, as you'll see, but they face unaffordable home prices in a sizable number of metros. Even slight attendants with median salaries of around $53,000 to $81,000 a year cannot afford to buy a median priced home in 25 metro areas. And the unaffordable metro areas are generally destination, destination communities like Los Angeles, Seattle, Boston, San Francisco, and New York. Um, now, there's obviously variation in how expensive different rental and ownership markets are throughout the nation. And in addition to highlighting affordability challenges faced by a particular slice of the workforce, we produce rankings that allow a comparison of rents and home prices in all 207 metro areas from the database. And this table shows the 10 most expensive metros for home buyers. So as you'll see scanning down the list, San Francisco tops the list. Um, you need almost $180,000 a year as a household. Uh, to be able to afford a medium priced home. Um, San Jose, Santa Ana, we have a lot of California metro areas on here, as well as New York City and uh, South of NASA, which is Long Island for, for those not familiar uh, with the area. Honolulu um, is, also, is also on that list, um, sharing that, that bad spot of the 10 most expensive um, metros. Um, so, Looking at this table, we can see, if we just look at, at, at San Francisco, um, that the $179,000 or $180,000 a year that you need to afford a mortgage for a median priced home there is far beyond the median salaries that we have uh, highlighted up here for elementary school teachers, police officers, nurses, not to mention the lower salary workers. And, and they can just really forget about buying a home in that sort of area without some kind of um, uh, housing policy assistance or um, uh, several other incomes added in there. So let's, uh, let's just move on to renting and, and forget about the bleak home ownership picture for a second. Seems like renting should be a little bit easier, but it looks not so much. Um, can workers in Honolulu, in this case, top the list of the top 10 most expensive metro areas for renting? Um, and workers there would need to earn around $73,000 a year to afford a typical two-bedroom apartment at hard fair market rents, um, or over $55,000 a year to afford the income, uh, to afford rather the, the one-bedroom fair market rents. San Francisco has knocked down um, to second place uh, where it was the, the most expensive on the, 
um, home purchasing side. So with a $73,000 a year minimum to afford a typical two bedroom and 55,000 for a one bedroom, it looks like the answer really is no, um, only if you're willing to um, double up, squeeze into a one bedroom in a couple of these cases, or uh, perhaps um, deal with the whole drive till you qualify syndrome that um, it adds a lot of um, transportation time and expense um, to what you're looking at. So now that you have a little bit better of a sense of the challenges and hopefully a much nicer audio experience for the rest of this, I'm going to um, pass you back over to Janet to get a little bit more of a tour of the database. Okay, so now we're going to actually take a test drive of the Paycheck to Paycheck tool. So you'll see on your link, Maya's pointing at the link to Paycheck to Paycheck on our website. So you can, on your own computers, go ahead and click on that if you want to drive it yourself, or you can follow along with us. Uh, what you'll see first off is we have a whole page devoted to Paycheck to Paycheck that gives you a bit of an overview that we've already covered in terms of the data that goes into the database. But also, as you start to scroll down the page, you'll see uh, that there are several other resources that are available. Um, and Maya had actually touched on it um, previously. Um, with each data release, we go ahead and we rank the most expensive housing markets for both home buying and renting across all of the metro areas that we look at. We also have a fact sheet that takes a look at the change in affordability of home buying in all of the metros as well to give a sense of how things are changing, are they improving, are they getting worse, where are these changes happening. And then we also post our report uh, from the latest data release, which Maya covered uh, just now. And in the report, we highlight workers in a particular industry or uh, with several common features and take a look much closer at some of the challenges that they face. So well, now we're going to go through and test out some of these graphing options. Uh, we're only going to go through two right now since the live transmission can be a little bit bumpy. Um, but just so you know, as you look in the box that contains the Paycheck to Paycheck database tool, you'll see that there are buttons that give you several different options for ways to complete the analysis. For example, you can look at wages for workers in one occupation across several different metro areas, or you can look at several different jobs within one metro area to get an idea of affordability across a range of different income levels. So for our first graph, we are going to start off in the first drop-down menu. And we are going to take a look at Memphis. And what we're going to do in this graph is select the five pre-selected occupations, which represents our essential community workers that we saw a little bit earlier. And the first graph that you'll see on the page is for the home ownership market. So as you can see, as you take a look, you have the first quarter of 2013 median home price of $111,000. You also get an idea of the income needed to affordably buy a median price home. And it looks like it's a fairly affordable home buying market for our moderate income workers, our elementary school teachers, our police officers, and our nurses. However, our lower income workers, our retail sales uh, people, and our janitors fall short of being able to affordably buy that home. Now that gap means that they might not be able to buy a typical home unless there's more than one worker in their household. Or, as Maya mentioned before, they might have to consider driving to like qualify. Um, or they might really have to uh, decide to rent. Now, if you scroll down further down the page, you can see the rental picture in Memphis, Tennessee. So as you see at the top of the graph, we have the fair market rents for the one-bedroom apartment of $648 a month and the two-bedroom apartment of $768 a month. On the left-hand side of the graph, again, you get an idea of the incomes that workers would need to affordably rent. And again, our moderate income workers are going to be able, most likely, to afford to rent a two-bedroom apartment at typical rents. However, you see our lower income workers falling short again, even falling short of a typical one-bedroom apartment. 
and oftentimes these workers are not just single adults living by themselves, but are supporting families. And being able to affordably rent a home means the difference in some cases between having sufficient room for your family or really dealing with crowding situations or not even being able to live in that area but having to move further to find more affordable rent. Now we're going to go back to our main Paycheck to Paycheck page and walk through another graphing option. So for our second graph, what we're going to do is we're going to look at one particular occupation. Uh, we're going to take a look at home health aid. And we're going to see what affordability looks like for them. And we have three pre-selected cities. Now, what you'll see when the graph comes up is that these three pre-selected options include the nationwide picture, the picture in Chicago, Illinois, which is considered to be a moderate cost housing market, and the picture in Los Angeles, a definitively higher cost market. And in the light blue, you see the income that the worker would need to affordably buy a home in these different markets. And the dark blue represents their actual median salaries. And you can see that these home health aides fall far short of the incomes needed to affordably buy. Uh, for example, nationwide in Chicago, you would need at least two, excuse me, you would need two um, home health workers to really affordably buy a typical home. However, when you look at a high-cost market like Los Angeles, that gap is much larger. And two home health workers wouldn't have a sufficient income by far to even come close to buying a home in the Los Angeles metro area. And this is a case where home ownership is really um, not realistic for these particular workers. When you scroll down, you get an idea of the renter picture. So, Thinking about if home ownership is not possible for some of these households, well, what about renting? And you see, again, the same uh, kind of challenges. The lightest blue represents the income needed for a one-bedroom unit. And the moderately shaded blue is a two-bedroom unit. And the dark blue represents that median salary again. And you see across the board that the wages for home health workers fall short of even that one-bedroom typical rent. Um, so really looking at not only needing more than one worker, but also if rent is already unsustainable, how can these households actually save up money to eventually buy a home? Um, so it's also thinking about some of the choices that they have to make to rent. So definitely if they need more than a one-bedroom apartment, you need more than one worker to support that. And so again, leading to potential crowding issues or having to live far from where they work or cutting back on other essentials to find ways to actually pay the rent each month. So this is just a, a quick overview of some of the ways that you can go through the Paycheck to Paycheck database. But as I have brought up several times before, you can also think about doing your own local analysis um, as we went through, there are some metro areas and regions that aren't represented in paycheck to paycheck because we don't have home price data available in some areas. So that's one reason to do a custom analysis is to get your own local picture. Uh, for example, what does housing affordability look like in Billings, Montana? Another reason to do your own local analysis is to get an idea of housing affordability within a metro area. So a metro area is quite large. And as I mentioned before, there's a core city and then surrounding counties. And the housing affordability is different in different parts of the metro. So using local data, you can really fine tune your look at some of these affordability issues. You can also adjust some of the assumptions and estimates that we use to be a little bit more reflective of local conditions. So there are various sources where you can get your own local data. For example, you can get home purchase prices from local realtors for existing homes or home builders for new homes. You can get an idea of local interest rates from your local area lenders. You can get estimates of local property taxes and property insurance from tax rates from your local assessor's office or insurance from local insurance representatives. 
you can get local rents from speaking with local area landlords as well as looking at HUD's fair market rents. And you can also obtain local wage data from your local chamber of commerce, from individual employers, or actually visit the Federal Government's Bureau of Labor Statistics website to get some metro area wage estimates. And now I'm going to hand it back to Maya to wrap this all up and give us some context for how else you can use Paycheck. Thanks, Janet. And, and thanks also to all of you uh, listeners who are, I should call you participants, not listeners. We've got a lot of good questions coming in, too. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit more of a sense about how to use Paycheck, and we'll start to, um, to cycle through some of the, the great questions that have come in and give a little bit more opportunity, uh, depending on how much time we have, to, uh, to dig deeper into questions that also leave you with a sense of um, how to continue engaging with us afterwards um, for your um, additional conversation. So at this point, you've heard just basically about the Paycheck to Paycheck tool and the type of calculations uh, and data that are in it. Um, you learn that full-time employment is not enough to make housing affordable. Um, for many occupations across the country, and you've seen the database in action um, and learned just a touch about how to how to um, take that concept and build off of it locally. So let's let's think now about how and why to actually use Paycheck to Paycheck. Um, research for research sake, that's not something that we really do here at NHC. Um, the wealth of data in Paycheck to Paycheck is intended to be useful for policymakers and advocates and practitioners and communicators. It's, um, uh, we don't want it to just be something that we use ourselves here. Um, and the graphs that you can generate, as you saw um, Janet going through, you can actually click on those and download them, add them to presentations and papers, funding proposals, um, all sorts of vehicles there. Um, they're a great potential tool to, to build on for communications campaigns about the need for affordable homes, uh, rental and ownership homes and for showing exactly which workers in your area are likely to struggle with high housing costs or excessive commutes in search of uh, less expensive units. Uh, the, the fact that it does have easily accessible data for metro areas in 48 states it, it means that this is really a great tool for policy advocacy, too. Um, while it's not congressional district level data and it um, does have some gaps in which metro areas and, and states have coverage, it at least provides a locally relevant view of housing challenges that real people are facing despite working full time. Um, so you should feel free to download graphs and share them with your representatives whenever there's a debate about continued funding for crucial affordable housing programs at um, the federal, state, or local level. Um, and as Janet described, you can also use Paycheck to Paycheck's approach to inspire a finer grained look at housing affordability data. There are a variety of reasons that one might want to do that. There may be um, issues about commuting distances and, uh, and certain counties where, where job growth is being sources of, of exclusionary zoning and, and not a place where there's a lot of affordable housing. Or you may be in a, um, a market where there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of young single person households and you know I think we've a lot of us have read or heard about micro-housing units and the, the, the move towards smaller and smaller studios. Well, um, if you were to go into the HUD fair market rent data set, the, the same source that we use to, to pull the one-bedroom and two-bedroom rents, you can actually pull rents for uh, the fair market rents for studios in there as well and pop that into the calculations um, when you're doing your local analysis. If, on the other hand, you're in an area where it shows that the demographic shift is, is moving towards larger households. Um, if you have an influx of, um, of pop, you know, a, a population with larger amounts of, of children in the household or um, folks doing extensive caregiving where a two-bedroom might not seem to be enough, you can also uh, use that HUD fair market rent data set to look at larger, um, larger size apartments. Um, there are really a variety of the, the amount of Local, um, locally relevant change and finer grained look that you can do are, are practically unlimited. Um, we at one point did a, a glance for, um, for the state of New Jersey where there are all of these coastal areas where property um, homeowners insurance is, is a much different um, 
and more expensive issues in coastal areas of New Jersey than it is in other parts, and trying to get a little bit better of a sense of what that does to um, housing affordability there. Um, communities with lower cost home ownership markets also really can use paycheck to paycheck. It, it at first uh, doesn't seem necessarily like it's a tool for explaining housing policy in a lower cost area, but these lower cost areas also have uh, different types of housing needs. Um, graphs can help to show the potential of first-time homebuyer programs and savings vehicles or other assistance with down payments and credit repair, as well as home ownership education and counseling programs. Because when you're at the point where incomes are close but not quite there um, about affording home ownership, um, and you think that these are workers who want that type of, of stability and the potential and um, you know, better times of, of a little bit of, of asset growth, helping them get to the point of, of having a down payment uh, can be very important. Um, the, the uses also really go beyond the housing community. So economic development agencies in more affordable metro areas may want to go and see paycheck to paycheck themselves and use it to highlight um, their affordability to potential employers and, and use it really as a reason um, to locate here. So. Um, we're going to start running through some of the questions that you have, um, but I'd also like to, uh, you know, invite you to think about how you would use Paycheck to Paycheck and, um, and maybe contribute that through the GoToWebinar or control panel as well. Um, so let's see. We had some. We had a question about the 10% down payment assumption, and um, one of the one. Of our concerns in doing paycheck to paycheck. There are a variety of ways that we could potentially uh, do the calculations, and um, we wanted to make sure that we weren't assuming the most affordable or the least affordable situation. We wanted to take a kind of middle of the road approach. And you can, uh, through doing local analysis, figure out um, you know a, a, a difference. But we had. We had arguments for, for doing a 20% down payment because that's what gets you out of private mortgage insurance and that's what, unfortunately, there's occasionally a push to get back to that extremely high level of, um, in my opinion, extremely high level of, of down payment um, where you know, there are programs where you can get three or a 3.5% 3 3 down payment and be able to access housing that way. We felt like 10% down payment was a decent um, middle of the road that then also allows us to um, to have a little bit more flexibility there. Um, let's see a couple of other questions here. Um, so we have one here. I think I'll let um, uh, Janet talk a little bit about some of the um, the issues around talking, just talking to reporters uh, about the data. Um, reporters um, is one of our uh, participants notes often will point out that families with dual income, so they may be within reach of, of households if you you know if you do some dual income pairings here, um, and also about the growing population of workers in different areas. Janet, you recently looked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics around high growth and large growth occupations. Can you say a little just a a touch. We don't need to, you know, go into the super level of data on this, but just a touch about what kind of incomes we're seeing there, and what you would say about how to how to approach thinking about dual income families. Thanks, Maya. Yeah, when I did take a look at some of the high growth, fast growing occupations, a lot of them do center around the healthcare industry. Um, not surprisingly, with a lot of the movement around the Affordable Care Act. Um, but one of the things that I did notice is a lot of the growth is in these lower income jobs like home health aides, um, nurses assistants, also nurses who tend to be more moderate income. Um, but thinking about there's growth in healthcare industry, but in a lot of these lower income jobs where, yes, you would need uh, to be dual income to afford housing, either renting, home buying in a lot of places. Um, and it is important to think about what's realistic for uh, single worker households versus dual income households. But 
as you can see in some of the high cost markets that we looked at, like Los Angeles, the gap between wages and housing costs is quite large. So even if you have a lower income and a moderate income worker, they might still fall short or they might really kind of come up close to that affordability level, um, but be unable to save the money that would be needed for that assumed 10% down payment, or in some cases, an even larger down payment. Um, or they might have to cut out spending on education and other areas to really amass the savings that would be needed. So thanks, uh, Janet. So we, um, we have a question also about the affordability calculation. So when we talk about uh, when we talk about the home ownership side, uh, we're talking about a 28% um, being being an affordable uh, mortgage. And when we talk about the rental side, we say um, you know a, a market isn't affordable if the, if the fair market rent is more than 30% of income. And it's a little bit of a um, it's, it's always a little bit of a gray area on that line. And some of our reports. Um, like housing landscape, um, we're much more inclined to focus on the severe housing cost burden. You're, you know, when you're paying 50% of your income on housing costs, it's much more clear that um, there are a few people who are, who are able to sustain that. Um, but there, um, for those of you who are in the, um, uh, the housing research or um, a little bit of a, I hate to call myself housing nerd, but um, the, there's an idea of, of shelter poverty where if you do have, um, if the rest of your income ends up being taken up by other expenses, and there are a variety of different ways um, where we can think about housing affordability where 30% of income um, is not necessarily some kind of a, a sort of magic number. If you're a single person with no dependents and no extreme medical bill, no extreme commute, um, you may be able to handle a lot more than that. Um, we do, you know, it's a little bit of an arbitrary line, um, but through the database you can get a lot more of a sense when you're looking at these individual um, graphs rather than the, um, the report findings graphs where I showed that you know, none of the, house, the uh, housekeepers and wait staff could afford a metro area. Uh, you can get a little bit more of a nuanced look at exactly how far um, beyond their uh, beyond their grasp is in a couple of these um, local analyses. Um, we also have a question about other potential uses of of the database, and you know what what more could we add? Um, we get a lot of really kind of exciting ideas about what uh, could be added to the database. And um, you know, Janet, I don't know if there's anything you want to um, add in about ideas for 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 future reports or, you know, call out for ideas for, for future reports. But um, as far as the, um, the database itself, we have a couple of um, areas where we're going to explore improvement, um, making it more accessible um, for mobile users. Uh, you know, it varies how accessible it is if you're on a, um, you know, an iPad or a, uh, uh, an Android. But there may be there may be more that we can do to make it really accessible. Um, I hesitate a little bit about adding too much more um, that you can pop right in at the database, um, but only only because I like the idea of, of a very simple graph. One of the things, for example, that we've talked about is merging the um, home ownership and renter graphs because you are seeing the same wages in each of them. Um, so why not help to, to demonstrate the um, the housing needs on both the ownership and rental side altogether. Um, so I'd, I'd be interested in, uh, in thoughts and comments from, um, from everybody, uh, either via email or, um, or through the, the question about whether, whether they think that this simplicity is better or adding in other things like uh, um, kind of merging the idea of a housing and transportation cost burden calculator with um, paycheck to paycheck or um, adding in a little bit more of a sense of um, what local family sizes might be within a metro area and um, what some of these other add-on costs. Uh, uh, there's a report that's a, a little bit old that I would not in the least say is out of date, 
It's called Stretched Thin, um, where we did, you can find that at www.nhc.org. And you can find in there the fact that uh, there are all these added costs. Um, and, and that report is really looking at things beyond um, principal interest, mortgage, and, and insurance, for mainly for homeowners. Um, utility costs that, that, that go up, and a variety of other costs that really do influence affordability that aren't included here in Paycheck. Um, Janet, do you have any thoughts you want to add on that, too? Um, just want to second what you said, Maya. I also noticed there's a great suggestion in here about uh, including childcare costs as well. That's certainly a huge cost for a lot of families, um, shockingly large, uh, as I have been finding out. Um, but like Maya said, we are exploring uh, different ways to improve the database. Um, I would love even more suggestions of what you would like to see, um, things that we can explore possibly outside of Paycheck to Paycheck or to augment it, um, and also get an idea of what occupations you're looking at in your areas and regions, um, what workers you really want to uh, understand better and get a better idea of their housing affordability challenges. So please share all your thoughts with us. Uh, we also have a question um, that, that I'm not going to um, uh, focus a lot on. Um, it's a very, it's a very good and, and detailed question about private mortgage insurance and, and how that um, um, disappears in, in in some cases and, and not others. And um, just to to go back into thinking a little bit about what our assumptions are. Our, our goal with Paycheck to Paycheck is primarily the creation of an interactive database that anyone, um, anywhere, uh, if you have internet access, can can go on and, and find out how uh, how how affordable housing is for workers in your particular metro area for a variety of of low and, and moderate income workers. Um, the wages that we use are median wages for, you know, not your extreme entry level, but the next step up from that. Um, and Paychex report kind of came out of the fact that we had this database that we were providing to people um, for all of you to be able to use in analyzing and documenting housing needs in your area, um, in, you know, making, you know, communications campaigns or policy and advocacy efforts. and. So the report is, um, in some ways, uh, a little bit more of an afterthought. And so we are um, exploring a variety of ways that we might do more with the report and think more about what some of these implications are. Um, so we really don't look at what happens over time with any of these mortgages. It's can you buy a home, a median priced home, at our assumptions. So. Um, you know the, the the set of assumptions. We're not looking at what happens down the road, and clearly there are a lot of problems with not looking at what happens down the road, as, as we've all seen with the mortgage crisis. The you know what type of mortgage you can afford on day one is not necessarily what type you can afford later. Um, however, this is we're looking at a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage, so we're we're getting around a lot of the later bumps, um, but we're not getting around clearly all of the all of the later. Um, bumps or um, potential increases in affordability. Um, we're getting uh, a lot of really great um, uh, feedback. I think you know you, you should all, um, if you like giving nerdy researchers smiles, uh, comments like, this is an amazing tool. Definitely be using it are a good way to uh, give, give, us, um, give us research folks a, a a smile and a realization that yes, these sorts of tools really are important. Uh, using research and finding a way to get it get it out of a box, get it out of a long report, get rid of um, you know all of the you know, sort of asterisks and footnotes and disclaimers as much as possible. Just put it in a really presentable way that allows policy and advocacy and practice and communication to um, to take it and, and run with it. And um, as we're thinking about this sorts of um, communications tools and campaigns and using it in um, you know, community needs evaluations and other um, to 
examples like that. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, um, NHC, now it's in beta testing, but NHC has a new tool it's called the Housing Communications Hub. You can access it at hub, that's H-U-B, dot N-H-C dot org, and you can get a lot of good um, resources there about communications campaigns and talking points and, um, you know, ideas about how you, you know, how you really do a communications campaign at the at the local or, or state, regional, national level. Um, there is also a discussion um, area on there so that if communicators have questions for other communicators, it's a good way to um, to build that network where you know, we know that it's 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 hard if you're the communicator in, in Anchorage to know how to how to find and reach the person who's who's talking about housing communications in you know in Fort Wayne or in, in Kansas City. So you know those sorts of things are really um, uh, I think hopefully will be tremendously useful to you. And um, as I noted, it's in beta testing. So if you find any challenges with the communications hub as you go on there. Um, Please do flag them and let us know um, any you know any kind of feedback on that. Our uh, marketing and communications director would be would be thrilled to have. Um, let's see if we have any other um, questions that we should look at. So there's um, you know we're we're getting these. Uh, some, some questions about specific things like, is there a way to see local data analysis on, on family size within a metro area? And there are um, great tools in, in, you know, fortunately we're not in the government shutdown, so census data is, is available a lot more readily. Um, Janet, do you want to talk a, just briefly about, you know, how someone who's not a, a, a data person could try to go to Fact Finder or, or a tool like that and, and find this sort of thing? Sure. Um, looking at data can often be daunting, even before you get to the point of looking at it. Um, but there are a lot of resources um, that help digest a lot of it. So Maya mentioned American Fact Finder, which takes data from the American Community Survey, which is kind of the, um, the extension of that long form census that some of you may have completed at some point that asks uh, large number of questions on a variety of different aspects of housing and household issues. Um, but what American Fact Finder does is give you these great tables that digest the information for you on several different topics at different levels. You can look by state, you can look by county, you can look by metro area. Um, so it's a great tool to explore when you have some time just to play around with the information that you can get. Um, on our website, uh, we also provided a link to do the custom analysis. And that lists several ideas of places that you can look for local data and gives you links to them as well. So it's a nice shortcut to find your way to HUD's fair market rent, to find your way to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, to get a lot of this information about wages and housing and other household issues. We're getting close to the end, but we have a, a couple of other questions I think we can um, we can cover. And one is actually a, a sort of a tip. Uh, for those of you who, who have posted questions um, with interest about sort of housing and transportation uh, combined costs, it is, um, there is a tool that we've, um, we've actually helped collaborate on at different points. And if you um, look back to almost exactly a year ago, we had a, a webinar um, called Losing Ground. It looks at housing and transportation, um, those combined cost burdens, and um, we worked with the Center for Neighborhood Technology on that. Um, so if you, if you go to um, you know, Google the Center for Neighborhood Technology, you should be able to help, um, that should help get you to their transportation cost tool. It's a great, um, definitely a, a, a great um, tool for those of you in markets where people are doing a lot of that sort of uh, drive to like qualify sort of thing. And, and you can see how generally whether you're sp spending more on housing in, in the center of the city and not driving as much or spending less on housing uh, but living farther out, the combined housing plus transportation cost is um, often fairly similar. Um, you, don't, you don't win a lot by, by going farther out, um, I say as in 
when they get to meet her. Um, <laughs> so um, as far as um, future uses of paycheck to paycheck and other and other expansion, we've talked about the fact that we're thinking about um, uh, looking a little bit more deeply into the report about ideas maybe around uh, developing more apps or things for the mobile market. Um, we also had a question about whether we would be expanding the occupations listings. And um, the answer is we, we often do expand them a little bit. Um, you know, we're, we would love to get feedback if you feel like there are jobs that are really not covered. Our focus in the occupations that we have is to look at a wide range of low and moderate income jobs. Um, look at a lot of jobs that can really not be outsourced. You can't telecommute from them. So that, that's a lot of the types of things that you'll see there are jobs where you, um, you really have to be physically present. So it makes a difference how housing costs are and if they're matched or mismatched with your wages. Um, we also try to look a lot at the fastest growing or the largest growth jobs or jobs that are in particular sectors that seem um, very relevant. Uh, if, you, if you look back at um, some of our prior paycheck to paycheck reports, we've um, we've at times looked at you know at the time when there was a big economic stimulus, we were looking at a lot of construction related um, and infrastructure related jobs. Um, we um, uh, we've also looked at jobs that a lot of returning veterans uh, were entering education programs to uh, to join those careers. Um, I mentioned the fastest growth. We've looked at um, healthcare workers and um, you know, retail season workers and travel workers and uh, so there are lots of different slices that you can that you can get there and um, we will certainly um, check with our um, our data provider salary.com to see whether they have um, sufficient coverage of some other jobs like like housing counselor uh, to try to add that um, to the database in, in the future as well I think that's a really great uh, great idea for additions. So we're, um, we're pretty much at the, at the end at this point. So I think um, it'd be good for me to let you see our, our contact information. If you have further questions, uh, please feel free to email either of us directly. Um, there are a lot of ways to continue this conversation, however. Uh, if you want to continue the conversation broadly, um, we have a housing policy.org forum, which you can access at forum.housingpolicy.org, and you can anyone can join and add a discussion, start a discussion, and um, we, you know, would certainly be happy to continue um, the conversation with you there. For those of you who work in com in communications, I mentioned um, NHC's Housing Communications Hub, which I think is a great place to both get resources and contribute yourself um, questions and discussion and in conversation there. Um, you can also uh, connect with with me on Twitter at Maya Housing, um, with uh, NHC and the Center broadly at NHC and Center, um, and go to www nhc.org to find out how to connect with us in a variety of ways and learn more about other events and webinars and uh, and, and publications um, and resources that we put out here. So thank you uh, again to Capital One for its financial support and in no way is responsible for the errors, especially the technical glitches, which uh, were clearly my own phone. Um, and thank you to, uh, to Janet for working on this project and taking it on so well, uh, and to all of you for um, your great questions and, and advice, and I, um, I hope that you have enjoyed this webinar. We will be uh, sending out the recording and slides to you um, after the fact. Thank you so much, and have a great day.